Good evening, everyone. I am Vallabhi Jalan. I am the convener for this evening on behalf of the collective Curating for Culture. Before we get started, may I please request you all to ensure that your devices are on mute, your WhatsApp tab on the browser is closed, and any electronic devices around you are on silent or no sound mode. These sessions are being recorded and screenshots will be taken for documentation and dissemination purposes. Hope we have your consent for the same. If it is convenient for you, we would request that the participants may keep their videos on during the session for making it interactive. Also, to avoid any disturbance during the talk on Google Meet, I'll be sharing a Google Doc link where you can put in your thoughts and questions. I would now request Ishita to tell us about today's plan and speaker, Amandeep Sandhu. Thank you, Vallabhi. Um... I'm quite happy to start kick off this first uh, dialogue in this series for constructing personal archives program. A uh, very quick intro into curating for culture. Those who are new to this forum, uh, we are dedicated to cultural preservation initiatives. And currently we have been working in areas of uh, archiving and curation, uh, curation for historical preservation and cultural preservation. Uh, we, have, we have done basically three workshops over the lockdown and uh, we, currently we're running the fourth program, uh, which is a four months long initiative where we have more than, we have about 20 uh, projects being incubated from across the world. Um, and they are all building their own personal archives, whether it's family, whether it's institutional or whether it's community oriented projects. As a part of this program, we also have invited uh, professionals from varied fields have worked with archival practices. Amandeep Sandhu being the first one, and we're very grateful that he accepted this invitation. Um, I don't want to get into too much of the formal introductions. I'm just going to read out the first two lines, I think, which you all have read, uh, that Amandeep Sandhu is born, uh, was born in Rodkela, Odisha, and studied at University of Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. um, he now works in the IT industry as a technical writer and lives in Bangalore. Uh, many different novels that he's written about. I'm still a novice. I haven't read it all, but I've studied the reviews. And um, Amandeep and I basically, we, our paths crossed at Nivedita Menon's talk, uh, which is, I think, earlier this year or later, or in the last part of December 2019. And just those few interactions with him is where I picked up that, you know, he is a writer who has interest in questioning the history and not just writing for the, for the art of writing. And uh, that I think stayed on with me. And I thought this was uh, the perfect per uh, profile or the perfect practice to introduce uh, on this platform for constructing personal archives program. Amandeep, thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation and over to you. You said you'll take five minutes. You took three. <laughs> <laughs> Kept it simple and stayed off. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, before we start, I want to uh, just warn everybody that there are two minor disruptions that could happen. One will definitely happen. And that is that I've recently become a cat slave. You know, <laughs> that a cat has entered my life and it completely dictates my life now. So he will wake up in about half an hour and then he will mew and then I'll have to go and put food for him. He, even if you keep the food there, he doesn't eat it. He wants you to come and do the gesture of putting food. You know, That's how pampered cats are now. Second is uh, Bescom. If the electricity goes, I'll switch to the mobile data. That might take half a minute. Uh, so, truth be told, I have been wanting to actually start talking about the book, the writing of the book. When it just came out, Arunava from Scrawl contacted me and said, uh, why don't you write about how you made the book? And believe me, I was so tired at that point uh, that, and I was exhausted by the interviews and other things, and events. I didn't have the stamina to do that. And then Scrawl, for some reason, did not. I mean, some reason is basically that 
most media does not have money any longer, uh, uh, especially the media which takes a critical view on society. So they couldn't commission a review for a long time, and then finally a friend wrote a review, a beautiful one. Uh, I don't think friendship played a role there. <laughs> so, uh, and the scroll review also come came. Because in some ways, scroll is a review one which has gained, you know, a sort of credibility in the circles. Um, they wanted to publish an extract from the book, but at that time, three people had already asked for extract, so I said no. So Arunava was, what is this? You don't do what I'm telling you. I said, yeah, please, you know, like I can't do it. Uh, the book, uh, I'm not aware how many of you know about the book or if anybody has read it. Um, I will, I, I, I'm choosing to keep this talk more about the making of the book rather than the book itself. Um, I've done too many of the book talks. Um, some of them are even available on YouTube. Um, so, but this making of the book um, seems interesting to me to discuss with most of the people I see here are, are younger professionals who are getting into their paths now, maybe five years, seven years. You know, I did see Chitra here and I'm like, oh my God, Chitra is here. You know, like, so, you know, and uh, 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 let me start by just opening the the page of the book and I'll share my computer with you. I hope you can see me, but you basically need to see the slideshow. So I'll do that. Now I can't see anything. This is not a good idea. Or is it? Can you see the slide show? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So this is a book that has been a few years in the making. Uh, this was my real danger. You know, I'm, I shouldn't be talking to a screen, but I guess when you're running a PPT, you need to talk to a screen. Um, yeah. uh, this is a book which has been a few years in the making. Um, the project I conceived of it when I was actually in Germany on a fellowship for another book that has still not come out, uh, still not completed, uh, a novel I was writing there. And then um, since we are recording, I can't tell you the whole truth, but I'll tell you this much that my agent Kanishka uh, got in touch with me and said, uh, why don't we do a nonfiction? And I said, okay, uh, but about what? And he said about Punjab. And I'm like, this is something I have been wanting to do for a long time, and um, I have not been able to take to it. So he said, uh, draw up a proposal, send it to me, I'll send it around to publishers. We'll see if we can get funded, then we'll start on the work. I did that. Uh, it took me three iterations of the proposal itself to do. Um, and that is how, and it's not that writing is hard, but it's, uh, is actualizing your vision, what you have in your mind, is hard. And, and Kanishka had an editor with him who kept nudging me to be sharper, clearer, more focused. And uh, finally, we had the proposal, which did the rounds with all the publishers. Almost everyone was interested. But I chose at that point to go with Kartika VK who is actually my university senior. And I have been in touch with her for the last 15, 17 years uh, when my first book was getting done. Uh, Arthika had at that point said to me, Aman, you would always be remembered by your first book. You might write 10 books in your life, but you'll always be remembered by your first book and uh, make sure that it is good. Uh, accidentally, the manuscript I gave to her at that point, she had kept it on her uh, drawing room chair, and her mother was leaving for Kerala from Delhi, and she picked it up and took it with her and read it on the way and uh, called Kartika to say, tell this boy that he needs to work a little more on his dialogue, a little more on building scenes, and Kartika told me exactly that, you know. 
And then when the book I suppose was ready and I went around looking for her, she was on maternity leave. Then she was changing from Penguin to HarperCollins. Uh, and I missed that bus completely with her. Uh, in any case, a smaller publisher accepted that first book. Then Rupa bought it out from them. That came out and the second book came out. And now when Kartika said yes to it, I was very excited. I said, oh, good. Finally, I'm going to work with Kartika. And Kartika said to me at that point that she would help me. Uh, I mean, the editor who I would work with would be Ajita. And uh, I was super happy because Ajita by that time had produced some wonderful books, including uh, the case ones, uh, the Gita Press, Jodi Joseph's, The Vultures. Uh, and I was like, oh, super, I'm going to work with a very good nonfiction editor. And, you know, as a writer, uh, it's now been about 20 years writing. Uh, it's been about 13 years to first publication. I have completely believed that it is the editor who makes the book. And that's not a very popular view any longer. But I completely believe that. Uh, and if you look at the previous centuries, books by various publishing houses, especially by Penguin, they were all shaped by fantastic editors. The writer, I think, is the raw material that the, and the editor is a sculptor. You know. They shape the writer. And uh, so when that, I had the prospect of working with Ajita and uh, with Kartika as the chief editor, I was very happy. And uh, I had some savings uh, from my fellowship and for the first year or so, I just started randomly traveling through India. That time, I had it in mind that I want to write a book, but I was very confused. And we'll talk a bit about that confusing pattern. But it all fell in place one day when on the anniversary of Operation Blue Star, I shared a picture by an artist, by a photographer who had taken that picture live on the first day, the Golden Temple was opened after the army operation. People had climbed on top of the minaret uh, in the Golden Temple complex, and they were just looking around. And it just struck me, this picture. And I was like, this is what I am also doing all my life. I am, we'll talk about how Punjabi or non-Punjabi I am, but I have been looking at Punjab in bewilderment. And I have no idea on how to start making sense of what is going on. Very interestingly, the first thing I encountered when I started traveling Punjab was what is right now the biggest thing going on in the country. Uh, it was a farmer protest against a particular kind of uh, white fly uh, disease that happens to, uh, to cotton crop. And uh, I was covering it. I was interacting with farmers. I was asking them questions. And I feel that I did that work then, that now I have the benefit of being able to understand exactly what is going on in the farming area. What are these new bills? What are they doing? What are... And that is actually the driving force why I went to do this work. To understand one location at least with which I'm connected in some way so that then I can understand what is going on all over the country. Just today, another piece of mine has come out on getting messages. Uh, it is discussing this farmer bills and the issues with them in a simple, easy to understand language. And people are saying, Oh, thank you. You wrote this piece. I'm like, yeah, this is exactly the work I chose to do with my life. I didn't want to, I wanted to resolve a number of questions that were in my head about Punjab. And when this happened, just at that point, uh, there was something called incidents of sacrilege that happened in Punjab. Uh, the religious texts were torn and thrown around and all that. And suddenly, the whole anger of the people shifted from an economic issue to a religious issue. 
and believe me in those 15 days or so that i was there i realized that this punjab is completely going back to where it was in 1984 where it has in partition time where it was forever you know in life and i said is my book done i mean have i have i seen it all and in some ways i had because i remember exactly 10 years before this happened 8 years before this happened i was in the same part of punjab my mother was very very ill she had uh, cancer she was also a cardiomyopathic patient she was a lifelong diagnosed schizophrenia uh, and she was dying and i needed to go to chandigarh to get morphine for her and just at that time punjab had again frozen because there was this guy called gurmeet ram rahim who is now in jail over rapes and all that but at that time he had done something which the sikh community had taken great offense about try to imitate a, a sikh guru and there was there was violence all over and i was like oh my god every decade we see this play out in punjab and we have not been able to crack it we don't understand why this is going on the other motivating reason for me to do the book was uh, <clears throat> that i wanted to uh, okay this is a picture and there are a few of them in this slide show from one of my talks uh, uh, earlier in this year some artist sat there and as i was speaking he started drawing sketches uh, uh, in some ways evocative of the themes of the book and uh, so i thought okay let me his name is kostub khare uh, very sweet boy i haven't met him we have only interacted over email and i asked him permission if i could use his work and he said yeah sure so so what i was really looking for is i once was talking to young people like yourselves in our policy institute um, around the time i was thinking of doing this book and i put up the word punjab on the board and uh, uh, i said okay give me one word that comes to your mind when you think of punjab and the kinds of words i got from people uh, really stunned me you know because there was uh, oh the sikh community oh the langar oh uh, dilwale dulhaliya ne jayenge sufi music bhindra wale terrorism uh, separatism uh, nice dresses lovely jutis you know like uh, simple words that come to your mind as soon as you and i if you put those words together on a board it makes a horrid word map and there is no way you can understand this word map from any side you know how, is, for example how do you put terrorism next to langar the langar is this great act of giving to the world of feeding the needy and terrorism is an act of killing innocent people why would the same people do these two things or why would they be known to have done these two things and so these were the kind of questions that came up in my mind when i was exploring the idea of working on punjab and that was another reason to go deeper and to understand what is happening so this one was that um if you look at this next slide i'll show it to you i was i realized at that point i was looking at punjab um this guy should have gone a bit behind uh around 125 years 175 years after punjab was annexed by the british the punjab was the last region of india to be annexed by the british i was looking at this punjab 175 years after that i was looking at it about 150 years after the sikh religion had become organized religion before that it was more of a sect and that that point for various political reasons and i explain them in the book the sikh uh, leadership decided to throw out most of the sects from the religion and to organize it according to a certain code of conduct and rules you know it was also 100 years after 
there was a grand movement to free the gurdwaras from british appointed mahants you know who had started all sorts of practices inside the gurdwaras uh, the sikh uh, people they formed a party called the akalis and they liberated the gurdwaras from the mahan it was almost 75 years after partition it was 50 years after the current state of punjab became an entity in itself a statehood was granted to it it was 25 years after militancy and the only question i had in my mind was has peace returned or has it ever been peaceful this land and the answers to it then came from you know how i started exploring the thing so the big question in my mind was again as i said where to begin where to begin telling the story i am both an insider and an outsider to punjab i'm an outsider in the way that i was born in odisha i was born in a punjabi family sikh family i imbibed the 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 texture the smells the uh, the the sounds of punjab uh, vicariously through my parents this is very different from somebody who is born in punjab who has a very strong personal memory of the land of the place so if somebody who was a complete insider of punjab what i call then that person perhaps would have written this book very very differently but my blood is punjabi and that's the only liminal marker it's actually subliminal marker i have of being from punjab and the blood in my veins is punjabi so i was also trying to understand this texture of my blood you know what what is this blood made of and that is why i am both an insider and an outsider to punjab that is why the book blurb also says that you know i was i don't have an aadhar card or a pan card or a land record a bank account or anything you know which is punjab in my life and yet i feel uh, before the book and certainly after the book i have a deeper sense of what that region what those people are so i had this advantage you might call it you might call it a disadvantage of not having enough personal memory and instead of this personal but not having personal memory i basically had a black hole in my heart which i was trying to find and understand but when you look at punjab what really happens is as i told you this incident of the farmer protest going on and then religious protest start and the farmers are completely sidetracked the economic issues are completely buried and now the religious issues become there. and then everybody is looking at who is the culprit and there was enough uh, murmurs in the society at that point that uh, it is uh, that baba ram rahim himself but there was no proof and the police had fired at peaceful jathas and two people had been killed then the dgp was changed you know that dgp incident he is now the guy who is on run from the police for the last 15 17 days you know uh, dgp punjab police director general police the senior most person and the courts have been passing orders after orders and he is untraceable despite z grade security that he had so he has he has abandoned even his security and run away somewhere why and it is all linked to the militancy years the years when there were gross human rights violations in punjab which uh, nobody wants to talk about and so this one case 29 year old case came up one lawyer fought it and got the dgp summoned but he has run away so this dgp was changed at that point i see my cat is now <laughs> doing its work uh, if it goes more than i'll get up for one moment um uh, but there is a landmine of another kind now given this history of militancy in punjab given what is called the sikh radical movement radical sikh movement uh and hence there are at least three strongholds in punjab right one is the ones who 
were the Sikhs, uh, the radical Sikhs, what you call it, the ones who sought a new state called Khalistan, the ones who saw the wrongs of the Indian state, uh, the ones who have been complaining forever, the ones who were at, at war with India in many ways. So there is them as a group. Then there is the left parties, which have consistently been pro-India, you know, and these radical Sikhs and the left, they hardly get along with each other you know, because they are both completely diagonally opposite to each other. And then there is the minority community of Punjab, and ironically in Punjab, they are a minority, is the Hindus, who were actually the first targets of these radical Sikhs, you know, when people were being pulled out of buses and killed and you know, violence, random violence was happening against innocent people. It was mostly these Hindus were dying. Then after that, Blue Star happens, then the anti-Sikh pogrom happens in 1984, both of them. And then Sikh community becomes a big victim. You know. But it started with the Hindus being victims. You know, and now they, they feel that they have no voice in the whole thing. And who are, they are not even acknowledged. You know. So... I realize that any question I have in mind, any any data that I'm collecting from anyone, and I'll show you some of it by and by, uh, it would, everything was contentious. You had no proof on what is what, because the movement, the, or what I call the non-movement, it hasn't made its own history. There are no real records of it. There are individual anecdotal records, but that is the, are they true? Are they not true? One can't say. They are, the state does not have data, you know. Uh, the, it's extremely pathetic. And even if you file RTIs, even if you seek data, I'll give you an example. For example, the number of farmers and laborers who have committed suicide in Punjab. Uh, if you ask the government, they give you a number of 585. At that point, that was the number they had. But if you actually look at three universities who have gone and studied the phenomena of suicide, they come up with a number. At that point, it was 16,060. So if you are like you want to wear your objective glasses, and you want to go into a situation as enmeshed as Punjab is, what do you do? What do you rely on? That becomes a big question. Because I'm, I'm hoping that uh, as a writer, when you are going to work, or as an artist, or as a, uh, as a choreographer, or whatever you, your trade might be, when you are wanting to work somewhere, you are, you have, I mean, I take it for granted that a person has an integrity that you want to put the truth of the situation out. You don't want to play up a particular narrative for political ends, which is most of the writing that is happening in the country today is like that. You know, I'm not that kind of person to tell you how to do that because I completely don't believe in wanting to do that. I only wanted to solve that weird word picture that had come up when Respondents had given me words about Punjab. I wanted to link those words to see if there is a way in which they can be linked. Uh, at the same time, I wanted to fill the hole in my heart. And why would I fill it with lies? And you must recognize that at that point, I was 43 years old, 44 years old. I was a person who was constructed by the state. Every input that had gone into me was the, the, the input from the state. I hadn't looked beyond, you know? And I wanted to then question my own self as well, because here I'm getting evidence upon evidence of people who are telling me things which uh, the state does not accept at all. I mean, forget things in the past, just simple things like farmer and laborers committing suicide. State won't acknowledge them. What do you do that with that? And yet, um, so there I realized that any story that one would tell would have to be from the point of view of an unreliable narrator. 
and that is a very favorite space for me and we will come to a slide which talks about what is an unreliable narrator but also realize that the gap in these narratives was women and dalits punjab is one of the most uh, it has a highest population of dalits 31.9% Uh, if you look at the Sikh religion, which was based on equality and justice, these were the two cardinal uh, points of the Sikh religion. And then you realize that there are thirty-one point nine percent Dalits in the state. You know, I, I, if I am a proud Sikh, you know, who has listened to my father, my mother, to the Gurdwaras of my childhood, read. religious books and like thought of kesi religion is really it was a much later religion it had already seen the problems with earlier religion so it was sort of it, it takes from islam it takes from hinduism it takes the best from wherever it was available at that point in history and it has been fathomed as a new beautiful syncretic religion and you start believing that being a sikh is a good thing and then you go on to the ground and you see that there are 31.9% dalits say It's a huge shock to me, but my approach to this was that okay, if Punjab is going to shock me, then let it shock me. But let me at least get to be able to saying some things which are true about Punjab, and not make a book which is full of what I consider lies. So, but women and Dalits are a big. Even now, the book is about five hundred and fifty pages, and but women and Dalit. i am not saying that they are missing from it but if a woman would have written the book she would have written it very differently if a dalit person would have written the book he would have or she would have written it very differently this is my point of view it is not the whole truth of punjab but it is my understanding but what does it basically bring you to this confusion that is happening in in a more philosophical sense it raises the question of how do you know what you know and that is true for everything even for the not only for the mind for the body for the society for the family you live in for the times that are going through uh, how do you know what you know is a very basic question what is the source of your knowledge and if you look at immanuel kant you know he said that there are two phases there is a priori and a posteriori you know so a priori is that you are open to you know learning and then formulating your thoughts but a posteriori is that you already have your thoughts and these were these word boxes that those people had told me in this word picture terrorism langar vidra wale sufi whatever you know and i am just trying to look for stuff to fit into these and fill out these labels but is it that word picture at all is punjab something else altogether you know that was the question i started asking myself who am i when i say this is truth on what basis am i saying that something is truth it is just my truth it cannot be a universal truth it will not be a truth that everybody would want to agree with they could have different views on any truth that i put out and that is when i realized that there is nothing really called non fiction in the world because when you say something is non fiction you have this sense that oh this is objective but there is nothing objective a professor friend of mine she once told me that uh, reality and representation what is the difference between the two is that representation is reality mediated through you per your culture you uh, you know the famous movie roshamon like right? so what happens in that movie you know, there is a murder and yet all the three witnesses have completely different takes on it and that's the same thing with with any region any people anything that you want to understand so to be open your mind up in a way in which you are able to receive all this input and then like at some point you wait for it to settle down and then make a book and then there is pressure like my agent was like really behind my life you know he kept on saying khatam karo khatam karo and i'm like no i'm i'm not done with it it'll take time you know like so 
So this a priori and a posteriori is, is very important to understand about any knowledge that you might want to, you know. And one can never really become a tabula rasa. That's what John Locke says, that your mind should be a clean slate and let experience write itself upon it. But that is also not possible to have because, say, if I'm eating a roti, for example, a very simple thing like that. You know. I mean, during the course of this book, um, I traveled for about 150 days and nights. And I say it in the book as well that I'm eternally thankful that at no point, no night, almost no night, did I have to pay for hotel or for food. Whichever village I was in, whichever town I was in, whoever I was meeting, I would just request them to stay back and they would keep me. That love and warmth, now how do you quantify it? How do you write about it? And these are homes in which militants have also stayed. These are homes in which anti-nationals have also stayed in the, when the British were ruling upon us. You know? These are homes in which there is patriarchy, there is feudalism going on, there is domestic violence going on, there is a girl child is not being allowed to study going on. All those things are going on and yet these are homes which are warm and loving and allowing me to spend a night there and not have to spend from my pocket. These are the contradictions of, of the reality of when we are trying to look at it, you know, instead of trying to follow an idea or somebody's construct of what a place is. There are also homes where I had brilliant talks with people. There are also homes that some evening somebody would open a bottle and we would have a drink also. You know, so all these things are going on at the same time. And my only effort and everywhere, I mean, I conducted, I don't remember the exact number, but about 200 interviews, you know, with people. And I was completely honest with them. I'm like, I'm open, you know. Um, I'm recording you. If you're comfortable, you speak. If you're not comfortable with the recording device, I'll switch it off. If you don't want to speak, I completely accept it. I'm not going to, just because I have come, I'm not going to push upon you to you know, give me information. Well, who am I? And why should Punjab reveal itself so easily to me? I mean, I'm just a tourist. I mean, so this is the difference what happens when you know, say elections are happening in a state and elections happened. I followed it from October 2015 till assembly elections, February 2017. Then there is a chapter in the book which sums up what happened post elections for about one and a half years, which is the period in which I was writing the book. Uh, but what happens when elections are going to happen is these helicopter journalists land you know, in a state. Now, Yesterday, Bihar was notified. You know. Now, suddenly, you'll have hordes of journalists going to Bihar. And within like three weeks, they're going to understand everything in Bihar. And they're going to come out with big sermons and big articles in newspapers and live TV reporting. This is where they will vote. This is what will happen. That is what is going on. It's like the whole electoral process in this country completely bullshit. We, we are not living in a democracy, if you really look at it. And the example I'll give you from Punjab is because when the militancy was there from 78 to 93, why do we call it 93? Because in 1991, they tried to do elections, but the militants killed about 35 Akali leaders you know, at one go. They said, you are not going to fight elections here. And so they were like, really, the count elections were countermanded one day before they were to be held. This great uh, hero of Indian Election Commission, Ian Session, recently passed away. You know, he he was the one who countermanded the elections. So they were delayed by one more year. They happened in 1992, and this time the main party, the Kali Dal, did not participate in elections. And the voting percentage for official records is 23 percent. But actual number of people who voted from those times would tell me not more than 10 to 15 percent people voted. You actually form a government based on 15 percent vote, and you think you have brought peace to the land. Or currently in India, I mean, BJP has 38 percent vote. They might be the largest party, but they don't have above 50 percent vote. 
should they have so much power so unless you go into something you don't start asking that kind of question i mean so much power that unilaterally in the last 5 7 days they have passed 40 bills in the lok sabha and rajya sabha which are going to screw all of us up anyway you know like right? so you can't have a country run like that or you can't have a region run like that punjab i mean what happens then when congress wins in 92 it is heavily dependent on police to carry out its work because remember for 6 years punjab was under president's rule from 87 to 92 so five years you know before that for one and a half years it was under president's rule after, before and after operation blue star So the police becomes the most effective force in the in the state. DGP Saini today running is because at one time DGP Saini was a great tool of the state to oppress and to push law down the throats of people. Now times have changed, and that's again that's exactly DGP Saini's excuse. Also, this was KPS Gill's excuse. Also, you know that. we did what we needed to do at that time we could not have contained it without violence and some of that violence was extra judicial but how much of it was extra judicial that is the question and now if you learn that 25 to 30000 boys were picked up and killed not only boys girls older people were picked up and killed and disappeared from society then that is gross human rights violations much worse than what happens in wars in many cases Give me a moment. Shaheen needs food. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'm just going to remind everyone that uh, you can use the Google Doc link uh, to put down your questions. I think two of you have put down your questions. If you can please put your name, uh, it will help me moderate the session afterwards. Um, and all the questions, like after that first opening line, would be. helpful to organize so this slide i'm putting up so that you can at least read it once and go back to i'm more comfortable with that group mode of you talking the other huge problem i had is that i am so english in my thinking my education has been english my studies have been english most of the books i have read are english Uh, i might not have fantastic english myself but my mind is so english oriented and here i had to deal with punjabi because everybody speaks punjabi the only language that works in punjab is punjabi and switching in my head from english to punjabi was a huge huge shift in my own orientation you know that once i became punjabi for that matter i it became even more difficult to shift back to english so here i am this multilingualism that was going on in my head and the confusion it would create i would have often fumble for words now it's been a year since the book has been out it's been over one and a half years since it has been edited i have come back to being okay with english you know but for about 2 years i was in between these two languages because most of what you need to know so now in the absence of data uh, knowing that the state narrative cannot be trusted uh, you need to either go back and read original histories in some ways i don't know what is original but histories at least or you need to read documents of those times or you need to look at social media look at what are people talking about look at journalism look at what are the articles coming out what are they mentioning you know like this figure of 16006 it came by by actually collating data from various sources you know and similar to everything else that is going on in kanjar so so shifting between these two languages was a challenge for me at least it was and i suppose if you have to work on any region like that it would be a challenge for you also because most of us today's urban india is english oriented you know at least our class of people you know and i had realized that there are you know anybody you talk to 
has about three or four hours to, to talk to you, which is just too much. I can't do more than one, maximum two interviews in a day, you know. So I'm going to listen to all, but I'm going to work with my experience on the ground. That, that was one thing I told myself. And when I'm listening to all, I'm not going to shoot the messenger. So if somebody say comes and tells me, I used to be a terrorist. And I could see a, a gun under his belt. You know, he's still carrying it around. Punjab, by the way, has one fifth of the nation's gun licenses. Guns are a very common thing in those bad lands. You know, like, and uh, I would ask a very basic question. I would say, have you killed anyone? Uh, and I'm very thankful that people said, no, I haven't. Because if somebody had said, I have, then I wouldn't have known how to deal with them. But everybody I met said, no, I haven't. But I can tell you stories. I can tell you this. So I would listen to them. I would listen to their point of view. I will give you a very simple example. Now, Bhedra Wale is a figure who is considered to be divisive for India, the leader of the separatist movement. But in Punjab, he has a Shea Guevara kind of reverence. Everybody considers him Sant. So people won't say Bhedra Wale. They will always say Sant Bhedra Wale. And that is a huge shift between what Delhi's narrative is and what Punjab's narrative is. Because for the Punjabi people, for the Sikhs especially, he was upholding religion. He was doing something very important. So this is how I would always suggest, never shoot the messenger. They might tell you things which might not be palatable to you, which might revolt against your understanding of things. But at least listen to them, because not listening to them does not help. And what we see nowadays on social media, what we see, how we liberals versus bhaktas versus Congress versus BJP versus all these Hindus versus Muslims versus Sikhs versus Christians, all these fights that are happening are because we are shooting the messenger. If we were to listen to each other, we'll be able to talk. In the, another big thing that happens about Punjab is that Everybody has, oh, green revolution ka problem ho gaya. Now, you just have diversified crops, yeah. Then you wouldn't have had this problem. Oh, cancer train is running. But why don't you have your own cancer hospitals? You know, this is how people deal with Punjab. It's like neglected part of history of India. You know, it's like never really wanted to come out. And the nation has so much to prescribe to it. And I was like, no. I am not going to take that view about I'm going to ask that if diversification of crops was such an easy thing to do, then why didn't Punjab do it? What were the difficulties in Punjab's ways of doing diversification? These Punjabi people are some of the most Jugadu people of the world. They are the most practical people of the world. Why wouldn't they do it if it was so simple to do? And when you ask that question, then you get things revealing to yourself that actually the government never encouraged it. That actually somebody gave 200 acres to the uh, Sunil Vittals, you know, and those guys, instead of doing cropping, they started making a factory there, you know. That actually every small farmer needs to earn profit from every season of crop, because unless he does that, he's going deeper and deeper into debt. So if you want him to diversify from, say, paddy to maize or paddy to something to peanuts, you know, groundnuts, you need to give him two to three years to do that because the earth is just too tired that without these pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers, the earth cannot sustain itself. And who will support that farmer for those two, three years? who is already under a debt of 7 to 10 to 50, 20 lakh rupees. 83% of farming of Punjab is under debt. So it is when you start asking this other question, no? but don't tell me what I should do. Listen to why I could not do it. Then things become very different for you. Your understanding changes. So that was one thing. 
I'll put up the next one and hope you see it a little carefully. Don't try to mug it up; it's not a big deal. But it is just I am trying to tell you where I was at that stage in my life. I'm sorry it should have been dated. I don't know why it is not dated. But what I realize is Punjab is a land of many conflicts, you know, and it's actually a land of where things have been. the battles have been going on for way too long and i tried to make this graph which was basically punjab's geography history politics image and trust and how punjab's land water text which is a big thing in punjab because the guru granth sahib is a text you know the quran is a text bible is a text most of these religions except hinduism they are all defined by a text how gender and how sanity of punjab itself why i put sanity is because actually i both the earlier books and my current work all the work that i do always is trying to look at the mind because i just mentioned it briefly my mother was diagnosed schizophrenic my first book was autobiographical about living with schizophrenia and uh, living under the shadow of schizophrenia and psychology plays a big thing in my my understanding of society so i plotted this graph that these are the areas of where casualties are happening and these are the battles that are going on so like land would have gateways kingdoms farm industry and the engine which runs the industry the farm industry is the migrant labor you know and all of them pertain to geography and say water the name of the region is from water major conflict of punjab with the indian state basically over the trifurcation of post independent punjab post partition punjab into haryana and some parts into himachal was a river water crisis which has actually led to the whole militancy period you know so that aspect of it similarly the text the vedic sanskrit text the epics the nath religion the buddhist religion islam hinduism sikh religion christian and the guru granth sahib this here and there i put it up you know they all belong to this geography everything was written in this punjab region and punjab by that i don't mean this punjab but a punjab which extended right from yamuna up to the spingar mountains uh, of what are now uh, the extreme uh, west of pakistan uh, almost on the border with afghanistan you know this whole region was punjab and all these epics were created there islam came here from central asia you know uh, christianity came from another route it came from the south you know but it was again a religion of uh, europe you know so so geography plays similarly gender how the roles are how it is feudal how it is patriarchal and how that is also linked to geography because this comes from constant invasions for 3000 plus years you know people are coming in through the spingar mountains they are looting plundering and they are targeting the most vulnerable and they are targeting the women in the society and that's why patriarchy is kept strengthening hide the women keep them behind parda don't let them go out you know let them not be kidnapped all these are patriarchal mores today and we hit them but they came up because of a need of an hour in another time when there were no security systems when we did not have freedoms you know and when we were being plundered constantly from the from the central asian side you know and it what it does to to the i mean insanity i covered weather and how the weather the extremely arid region daily fluctuation of temperature over 20 degrees you know whether it's winters or summers you know very short but very brutal monsoons that happen there how it affects the minds of the people what happens to their heads those who live there it's not peaceful like south india is you know like oh nice Bangalore is AC city, you know, like it used to be like thirty degrees was the norm here. Punjab is not like that. So what happens to people in such places? 
similarly i made this whole you know sort of a matrix and that is all i could do for what year you know i was like now where do i go from here you know my big question was what should be the structure of the book because the travel was between october 2015 to february 2017 uh if it was a journey then and the book title now is journeys but in the original proposal it was journeys but in between believe me i went through major crisis on what to name the book how to divide the chapters you know how to structure the whole text you know if it is journey then a travel log is always a linear linear narrative you know so here as i said to you i faced the agrarian crisis i faced a religious crisis then next to that happened was the election mood started changing one year before the real elections you know and then came back to the water issue when the syl canal came up in the in the courts a decision on it and that's where kejriwal made a big mistake you know and it went back to agrarian issues again because the harvest time was upon us by now the wheat harvest time was upon us you know and uh, just after that when the aap released its manifesto it put a broom on the cover picture because it, that was their logo but they also had put the a picture of darbar sahib a golden temple on that and the kalis just nitpicked on them and made a big issue out of it they go oh, you have insulted the golden temple by putting a broom on top of it you know this is petty talk but it becomes a big news at that time you know so i saw that issues are moving from agrarian to religious to political to water to back to agrarian to religious to water because syl hearing came up again you know so how do i do this book do i say okay november i was here in december i was here on this day or that day that would not be a book that would be a travel diary the book has to give us more the book has to finally give us more than newspapers gave us the book has to give us more than what columns gave us the book has to create something much more tangible otherwise why write a book so this because the journey itself implies a linear narrative but issues were cyclical so i i was in major flux in my head on how to chapterize this i have this information which fits in a in the in the previous slide if you see which fits on this this graph it fits on in this matrix but i didn't know how to make a, a pages out of it and i my whole issue was is the title good enough is the title telling what it should you know and i made lists of titles and titles you know kind of crisis casualty of punjab the trust deficit you know various kinds of titles i was inventing nothing was as evocative as this one is but i just kept in my head because i couldn't make progress with writing or with chapterizing i kept doing this work in my head and i kept wondering about what should be the opening line what should be the opening line and now i think we can go back to looking at my computer a bit but finally as i said earlier editor and i'll start with something uh my editor said to me he said you know just write whatever comes to your mind it will all start falling in place on its own don't worry about it can you trust your editor what what does he mean he works with so many people how does he know what are my crises you know he knows what he knows he knows how to structure language and all that what can he tell me about how to work on my book and these were the questions in my mind but i kept making notes and i'll show you something and then we'll go back to it and then he one day called me when i put up that picture which i first showed you remember the picture mm. this one you know when i put it up uh on facebook he called me and said aman can this picture be the cover of your book and like kartik really he said i have actually bought the picture because when i met satpal darish from home who showed me these pictures 
uh, I said, sir, this one, this should be the cover of my book. I just said it like that to him. And when Karthik said the exact same thing to me, Karthik is Karthik Venkatesh. He works with Westland. Oh, that story I didn't tell you. Huh? So then Karthika moved from Harper Collins to Westland. And she told me, Aman, I'm moving, I'm sorry, but, you know, career and all that. I'm like, okay. But Ajita is there, no, at Harper. I said, I said yeah, yeah, Ajita is there. Three months later, Ajita messages me and said, Aman, I'm moving to Westland. I'm like, no way, this is bloody shit. You know, you can't abandon me once again in my life. I mean, like, I have been, like, wanting to work with you editors, and now you're abandoning me, you know. And... Uh, I said, okay, but for your career, you should go. But can I come? Will you buy me out from Harper? They said, yes, we'll buy you. So I called up my agent and I said, Kanishka, now do whatever, but get me out of Harper. Uh, Westland will give me a contract. Kanishka is like, no way, we don't do that. It's not right. I said, yeah, enough. You know, you have to do this for me, please, please, please. And he like, he, he he then talked to this thing. Then I talked to the commissioning editor there. And they were very, very nice to me. They were very polite and gentle. And they allowed me to go. And when I came to Westland, Kartika said to me, you know what, Aman? I don't think Ajita is the right person for you. I'm like, what the hell is this now? You know, like I came to you because I wanted to work with Ajita. Now you don't want me to be there. And she said, no, I think the right person is a guy called Karthik Venkatesh. Like, okay, uh, who is this guy? But I remembered I had met this guy once in another guy's book launch. And he had said to me, your proposal had come to me, you know, at Westland. I was so tempted to take it on, but then I couldn't, I couldn't afford to at that point. Uh, Harper paid you more than we could have paid. And I said, yeah, but this was not really about money because you know, anyway, I got like two and a half lakhs. Two and a half lakhs doesn't even buy you clothes for two and a half years, you know, three years. You can't run a family on that, you know. I mean, my family is very small, thankfully, but uh, you can't run you can't run expenses on what they advance. So. Publishers give a writer like me. I mean, like I know of writers who are um, about their quality of writing, but they get big advances. So that happens. So. Anyway, I said, Karthik had told me that he's interested in my proposal, I told Karthika. He said, yeah, yeah, he is, and he's very excited to work with you. Why don't you meet him? And that is when Karthik had called me to say, why doesn't that become your cover picture? And I'm like, really, Karthik? He said, yeah, really. I said, OK. I cried. I cried my guts out because I was so relieved. I was getting a path to write, to start writing. The book. I mean, I was making hajar notes before that, but I can start writing the book. And I want to show you something here. When Karthik got it, the contracts I told you, no? Oh, no, that is contract. Contract. You see, there was Harper Collins and then there was Westland. She did so messed up my was. I'll take you through this story, but uh, so I wrote the preface, and it has stayed exactly the way I started writing it. If you want to learn Punjab, be ready to count its corpses, said the photographer as he reached for the drawer in his desk on that spring afternoon. That Pal Danish and I had met at his shop, you know. So the preface, uh, of course, Karthik makes a lot of changes. But he said something at the end, and that is this.
this one sentence it came from kartik's heart it touched my heart and it made this book possible this is what gave me the whole confidence i wanted to and it it that becomes a relationship like that that you want to please your editor you know you want to earn these lines from your editor again and again and again you know and kartik is so fucking stingy you know he like he doesn't give you compliments very easily but when he gave it to me there at my first attempt at writing the preface i'd sent it to him i was like okay that was now i'm getting the book done and so hence begins the now let me show you what all things one does to to get information you know so i now this is my final folder on the book which has various things as these artist renditions that i'm showing you it has stuff related to the book i mean my bio and this matrix i have kept to show anybody who wants to know you know some contact this is this is post post book done you know media contact list want to send personal list want to send copies of the book uh, final draft this was the final pdf you uh, know this one you know of the book came on 10 9 2019 book came out by around 17th 18th of october that year uh, this is a pdf with watermark which you need to send to sometimes to interviews invites we are doing the punjabi translation they are right now all the chapters are done you know like so uh, that is that work is going on uh, then the reviews that have come over a period of time you know like so. uh, but the most key folder is this the folder remain i called it right in the beginning i called it fault lies it remain fault lies but it just couldn't you know uh, this is a much later i brought it here so the date is wrong um uh, a word on grants look at how many people i applied to and nobody funded it <laughs> you keep trying you keep trying uh, there was something here uh, you were right to so it so there was ha uh, past there were these many also you know some personal some uh, official and nobody wants to put money on making a book happen you know like because honestly and i've heard it from others nobody thought i could have pulled off a book like this because it's it's uh and we'll come to what it is really uh they didn't give me half a chance that i can do it what was most interesting was that in my mind i was already segregating the areas i want to talk about and uh, if you ignore the first one which is basically a uh a, a activist group you know produce reports but agrarian crisis was a big area in my mind i think we have overshot the time but that's okay no you're cool or not yes yes uh, yeah. we will okay. yeah yeah we have yeah yeah, yeah. <clears throat> i'm in the middle of it so let me show it to you so the like agrarian i started collecting every news item that would catch my attention and if you look at it here there are 551 items which is about 250 articles because it it says folder as well as you know the articles but these many and this is how you call out data to understand what is going on and this is all data that you are getting from media actually media itself might not have that data because it's coming from different papers it's some hindustan times tribune indian express other smaller websites punjabi tribune ajit jagbani punjab kesri various media but between them all this somewhere have everything that you need just that it is not lying at one place where you can book and reproduce in your book so it is just about agriculture you know you look at the kind of things what is this i'm just clicking random things huh? ah see this is now very interesting we were talking about agrarian laws you know and one of the biggest changes that happened in punjab agriculture law history is uh, 
in 1936 sir chotu ram came up with brilliant laws to govern various aspects of punjab agriculture remember uh, something very critical to know about punjab is that what we have been calling green revolution and punjab 1.5% of nation's land creating 60% of nation's food grains so that india does not go into a food grain crisis remains unacknowledged now full of pesticides and insecticides this is a narrative we have right but if you look a little behind this narrative then you realize that perhaps calling this a green revolution was a misnomer because there was no green revolution that happened revolution is when the means of production of something are changed and means of production changed not in 1960s not by lal bahadur shastri they changed in the 1870s when the british started erecting their canals to link the bari and the dwab you know uh, basically between the river uh, ravi uh, chenab and uh, on to rawalpindi and lalpur and they created this huge agrarian lands and as soon as they created them they came up with something called the punjab alienation act which was sort of like the doctrine of lapse that you all would be familiar with that if a farmer does not have a male child then the property goes back to the british like it would go for kings you know and there was major revolt against that and there was major crisis in agriculture finally it took 36 years more for sir chotu ram to come in and to create laws which everybody could agree to and were happy with now so some one of the things that you suddenly find is something like that you know the punjab debtors protection act 1936 and then you need to study it even if you are not a law student you need to see how what it means what it was you know and it's a whole lot of information here i just took a random click what is this one see look at this somebody has actually studied the various soil types of punjab and i just wanted to to get the sense of it because i wanted to see why is some part of punjab whitish why is some part of it red why is some part of it black you know what happens in what kind of soil and then you go into find some article or it that you save it in your agrarian folder you know uh, other bad things are also happening some gruesome murder in the house of donors and uh, this was at an abor farm house there was a dalit attack a dalit guy's arms were kicked were cut you know now if i were in that linear structure i would have been like juggling around with what to tell and how all of it would have remained patchy but because kartik said make it thematically there is no problem if you go back in november and reference back to previous april and say you know that time something happened which we are covering here that is all he needed to tell me but until he told it to me it just wouldn't come to me now there is some dalit attack is actually got left out of the book Karthik, by the way, has also removed eighty thousand words from my text. Huh? So he's not all goody goody. Please. <laughs> so, there is another huge fight brewing on the ground of Punjab, in which there are legally the Dalits are entitled to one third of the common land, which is called the Shamlat land. You know, I have talked about it in one chapter, yeah. and. Uh, i i was very fascinated by the struggle because punjab is mostly considered sikh but among sikh also it is mostly considered jat jats are land owners they are the ones who own the political economy of punjab but when dalits struggle for something when dalits are fighting and i'm very interested in that battle i it very feels i i would start collecting information on what dalits are doing there are various publications that come out Surkhli is one of those publications, you know. It's called Red Line, basically. And here, farmers struggle against indebtedness and peasant suicides in ongoing Punjab. Continuous sit-in has been going on for 26 days in Bhutinda. This doesn't even come out as news any longer. It is left to these small magazines to cover and to bring out and tell you. 
that this is going on. 26 day long strike. Nobody covered it. This, this is one of the most valuable tracts that you can get and it is available for every big uh, region of India. This was a district gazette years. This was uh, the creation of the British. You know, they would send regular reports on what is going on in the district. And they are one of the most authentic sources of information that you can have. See, this, the edition of this gazetteer has been in great part rewritten from collections of fresh material. They would do this documentation, which India as a country, as since independence, we are not doing. But the British did it for us. This was the gazetteer from July 1947. Imagine, in one month's time, this region would be divided. Forever, the history would be changed, because partition happens right in Amritsar. No? And so this becomes a very, very important document in that sense. And what is it talking about? It is talking about physical aspects of the land, history, who are the people, what are the economic activities, what are the mines and minerals here, what are the arts and manufacture, other trades that are going on, what are the means of communication. And famine. In Punjab, in 1947, there was still a famine going on. And then it talks about how is the uh, official machinery arranged here? The administrative divisions, the civic and criminal justice, what is the army doing? What are the police and jails doing? This is fascinating stuff. And uh, if you were to just look at like one source or another, it doesn't work. It, it works when you're actually finding out when you're actually, uh, there is a farmer's movement going on for the last 80 years. And, uh, 40, 50 years in Punjab, it's called the BKU, you know. But who are these people? I was trying to understand that. Very first day, I entered a BKU uh, strike. But then I went back to read that who are these people? Somebody wrote an article in it in one of the magazines. And it starts with Karl Marx did not assign a revolutionary role to the peasant. It was Lenin, Lenin assigned that, you know. So some leftist guy is writing it, but it gives you very important information about these groups whose current face might be very different from their original face when they started as a group. But where do you go for that information? Nobody, no leader, no old timer, no full time worker can tell you that in the way that would make sense to you, you can understand it. But once you have read this, and then you go to the old timers and ask pointed questions, then they tell you more and more and more. That's also part of how you do the research. So this was one folder. Similarly on drugs, uh, you see there are about 150 items. I mean, it says 301, but that's because folders and this thing. And you look at stories. How different is your IMFL from Desi Daru? I've actually talked about it in the book. How the movie Urta Punjab sparked a debate on something. This is my own article, I think. Uh, so how the addiction centers are opening and closing? Something the previous chief minister opened, but it is now closed. Then you read into it, you find reasons, oh, this happened, that happened. Then when you go to that village or that region and you ask those questions, then people start telling you things. So basically, this collecting, I think the internet, this age, this time in which you can save all these articles was a great help to me because I started to go deeper into understanding Punjab and not listening to narratives about it. How Kabaddi players are involved in smuggling drugs. Uh, how something has become from a picnic spot into a heaven for drug addicts. Then somebody came up with a new statistic. Less than 1% in Punjab are addicted to drugs. I was like, okay, this is another trip to go on to. But the point is that there was 
this investigation going on in my head very lay investigation every day i would sit for an hour or two hours just keep reading just keep saving make questions out of it go back and take it to people so similarly on education uh, there is a huge education is a huge mess in punjab uh, but what i wanted to, uh, then epw came up with a special issue on punjab so i saved all the chapters of it so that i am at least in touch with <clears throat> what leading intellectuals and economists and all are talking about i they were never my audience but i wanted to learn from them so that i can talk about those things in a way in which it makes sense because who reads epw you know people are reading my book at least religion is a big issue in punjab you see 304 items various things going on but what i wanted to show you here is something even deeper is that while you are collecting media you are also collecting articles and reading lists and a lot of pdfs on punjab you know so this is a list of those sukhpal singh is a major agrarian scientist you know he made a book or an article here is an article in which he talks about the commission agent system in punjab agriculture fantastically informative article this one was uh what do you know what i mean yeah so the genealogy of the dalit faith the ravidasya dharam you know ronki ram is a major intellectual but if i had sat and interviewed him over it he would have told me 10 things now when i read this i get 50 things from this so sometimes it is very important to not really go to primary source to get stuff from him because your pursuit is not to just capture what he is saying your pursuit is to go into an understanding of the phenomena of what has happened and and i mean i came to this before ronki ram took me here but the actual guy to go to is is mangu ram you know who talks about the aad dharma movement and then to go back into the aad dharma religion and when i went to their sanctum sanctorum i started asking stupid questions about baba people shah and others and nobody knew on the ground nobody knew finally one guy said okay i'll take you to the house where they lived i go to that house it is closed it's next door neighbor there is a very old woman hefty very strong looking but very old she said she was 80 i don't know how old she was really but uh, she met me and she is telling me such simple things about these guys lives you know? how they were good for nothing how there was no real money for them how one sweeper came and they said okay mata we will help you and they started picking up cow dung from the street and people saw them and then they were inspired that these guys are actually benefactors of the chamar community and gradually these guys became the gurus and saints of that community <laughs> and this this is been told to me by an ordinary next door neighbor who has actually seen them all her life So who would you trust more? Would you trust uh, Siso, who told me this, a Shish Kaur, her name was, or would you trust all the things that you get from media or from intellectuals or from the sanctum sanctorum itself? And that is why I record Siso's uh, conversation with me in the book, because that to me seems to be the most authentic than all these other drama that I'm listening to. Yeah, this was a Adharam book, you know, a very, very, very important uh, movement it was. Manguram was a very important person in the in the movement, and then, if to your shock, you would know that Aad Dharam as a religion was taken out of the census in the 1961 census. You just remove the name of the sect from the census, and you misidentify a whole people, and that is why now with the 200, 2022 elections coming, the the chamar community is saying put us back into census as a independent religion then we will see how many people come to us and i'm sure about 20% of punjab will go to them or maybe 15% definitely so naming go back to manual khan go back to a priori a posteriori labeling is so important in understanding reality and in rendering reality through your representation that is something you won't do if you were not to do this madcap sort of a journey like mine you know i'm not 
putting it up as the only way to do it, but this is one way in which I did it. Okay, so reading, a lot of reading. Al Biruni's India. What was India in Akbar's time? You know, now, what does Shodh Ganga say about Akali Dal? Shodh Ganga, interestingly, you might think is a very right wing publication, but it actually has brilliant summaries on various various topics in the country. And then suddenly, Amandeep, uh, sorry to interrupt. Just wanted to know should we like wrap it by say 6 30 or 6 35? So we have enough time 30, for questions. 35, I'll finish by then. You know, this okay. is a, a friend who wrote a little post on email about her child playing a battle game in his drawing room, you know, whatever. And I just copied it because it was an idea for me to work on the book. It's just simply, my son's play area often resembles a war zone with Lego bricks scattered all over the place. But I look at Punjab and I realize this is a whole region is a war zone. It's an eternal war zone where the war never ends. Uh, now you put this thing in my head that I should wind up. But let me show you something else. Uh, Okay, I just wanted to show you the recordings I was doing with people. There were like mm. <laughs> some 375 files of recordings. You know, and many, many people, Farmer 1, Farmer 2, Gadar Song 1, Gadar Song 2, Artosh 1 and 2, Hindu and Amritsar 1 and 2. Long interviews, huh? 22 minutes, 12 minutes are just recorded. You take time to warm them up to record, you know, something is 50 minutes, Jai Singh is 50 minutes, then 21 minutes, Danki is 30 minutes, 28 minutes. So this is all stuff that you are gathering. But none of this really makes the book. Arjan had a filmmaker was roaming around with me. He was also interviewing people. He sent me his recording. I mean, we were together, both of us. Then some random pictures I was taking of Punjab. It was almost line date wise. And then I just got tired. I said, none of this is making my book. Yeah. This is all recordings with one person, very important person. Okay. This was something important I wanted to share with you guys. So what then becomes the narrator's location? While the narrator is taking you on a journey, through Punjab, which is basically asking you to shadow him as he is journeying through Punjab, then what is my position as a narrator? I always choose to keep it a little below the reader. You know? I am talking up to the reader. I am saying, boss, look at it like this, look at this like that. I am not telling the reader, hey, this is how it is. You better believe me and understand what I am saying to you. I never wanted to be in that commanding position. Because I feel, I mean, a reader is a friend. He's come, he has spent money, he has spent energy, he is opening the pages of the book, he's turning these pages, he wants to learn something from you. Take the reader along gently and take the reader along the way you would sort of take, a tourist guide would take somebody on a, on a location. Don't really have to talk down to the reader. Most nonfiction ends up talking down to the reader throwing facts and figures and you know, things at the reader. But it may not do that. Talk up, inform, point, but never talk down. And one thing, now Punjab, as I said to you, is a, a land in crisis, major crisis. You know, but one thing in my mind was, I will not make this book a pornography of pain, either militancy or of the agrarian crisis. So I met hundreds of families where husbands, sons, uh, fathers had committed suicide because of the agrarian crisis. I don't portray one single in the book. Because I don't think, I mean, if you are a reader, you are intelligent enough. If I tell you this person took you know, fertilizer or pesticide and killed himself, you know, you know what killing means. You know what happens to the family after that. Should I really have to tell you this widow is sitting against the wall? The wall is of pink color, but the pink has faded now. And there is a painting behind it. 
the painting, the plastic uh, garland on the painting has faded, as faded as the dreams of this family. I mean, does that make sense? And that is why I was, I know much of today's writing is actually pornography of pain, but I was completely dead against doing that. I don't want to milk your emotions to move you. I want to reason with you and move you, if you move. And that is why I was not pushing, pushing any agenda except one. And that agenda is this, of trying to bring Punjab together. Because what really hurt me about Punjab is that it remains broken down. And so that matrix that you saw earlier transformed into a, a table of contents. And then there were chapters. And many, many people say that this was a very good chapterization of the book. You know, because everybody has looked at Punjab in various ways. Actually, there are no comprehensive books on Punjab. Like there are no comprehensive books on many states of the country. But even when there are, they look at it through politics or they look at it through economy. I'm like, no, those are not the fault lines. Fault lines are where Punjab will break. And these are the areas on which Punjab will break. You know, if the apathy of the state continues, if people's anger goes beyond a certain level, the illness of Punjab might just subsume Punjab. The breakdown of faith in the society might just erode Punjab. You know, it's a false sense of masculinity. You know, and the medicines that is consuming all the time, including drugs, the water issue, the land issue, the loan issue, the caste issue, the fact that it keeps throwing out people from its fold. I told you that in 1870s, the religion came about by throwing out people. Now, still they are doing that. You know, throwing out like somebody like me who is a cut sir, is not a Sikh anymore. And what is it about the border of Punjab? It is such an important part of the country because it is a border state. The longest running open border where war will happen if India goes to war with Pakistan, you know. And we don't even look at it as a border state. And education and corpses. And then because the election of 2017 was on my birthday, so birthday. And then there's an epilogue, as I said, I mean, page 522 to 541 is where I'm summing up what happened in the year and a half after I did this. We'll skip these images. Yeah. So my question really was, how do we talk about healing of Punjab? How do we talk about bringing, restoring real peace in Punjab, not just aggravating its wounds? And that is why the three groups, the radical Sikhs, the left, and the Hindus, touch wood, it doesn't look good, my seeing it, but they all liked the book because they realized I was not, I was very political, but I was not being parochial. And that is important to do in your view. Uh, in summary, I'll just uh, take one minute from you and so what is always important is not only the text of what you're writing, but understanding the subtext of where it is coming from. Intention and sincerity is to bring Punjab together is what really works and try to get under the skin and not fall for the rhetoric. The flip side is when you are twisting and turning your head so much, you might get into depression, which happened with me. Uh, an excellent doctor in Bangalore, Dr. Rajiv Bide. He has been with my family for a long time. He helped. Uh, I was taking medication and it is only because of that medication that I managed to finish the edits of the book, which took us one whole year. You know, it took us a very long time to edit it. And uh, Karthik, as I told you earlier, threw out 80,000 words. And I'm just ending with this one last picture, which is by another artist. It's called uh, Sharda Kerkar. She sort of summed up the book in this. I leave it here and I'm open to questions. I know I overtook the time, but I think it was okay. No? <laughs> yes, it was. I mean, I cannot deny the fact that uh, 
we wanted you... to hear about the process and uh, you made sure that we got in and out of every aspect of the process uh, thank you so much because i think uh, especially now more than ever before this whole idea of interpreting writing researching about history needs to be seen from more humane and more experiential lenses rather than just the academic not taking away the academic but yes also the experiential aspects of writing histories so thank you so much uh, so, so, i think so let me just uh... let me just sum up the book now at this point when you look at it so it is a uh, caravan scroll hindu in the business line they all kept asking me to write articles uh, on what i was experiencing seeing on events that were happening these articles became sort of the spine of the book but i realized that these are journalist articles why do i have to make a book when they are already written you know and then i realize what is missing in them is contextual history because i am only showing what is happening now i am not telling the background to it i am not telling what are the situations which created these these events uh once i had the journalism and the contextual history together i said is this a book and i felt no because there is no rasa to it there is no heart in here how do i understand this and that is why i weaved in memoirs into it that this is my journey 20 years back 30 years back this is what i was seeing now i'm seeing this and this is the change that has happened in this society so the book is finally a travel log a contextual history and a memoir fused in with each other and that is what makes it 580 pages and that's there in that slide if you look at that slide it 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 covers sort of everything that is in the book yeah okay thank you amandeep thank you so much for this very uh, intriguing conversation um obviously as far as the format is concerned uh, we can't afford to take a break now um we'll move on to questions and i think i'm also going to hold on to my own questions because we have quite a few questions from the participants and the audience themselves so i personally prefer as a moderator to keep it a open dialogue rather than make it about just my voice but i have one key question which i would like to end with perhaps towards the end um and uh, okay and i'm going to request everyone um, to keep your questions short uh people who have more than one question if you can right now pick one really important question so that we can keep to time if we have more time we can surely come back to your next question but it's also to make sure that if people want to leave at 7 7:15 then they don't miss out onto the dialogue as well uh and amandeep you also if you feel that you know maybe one or two questions could be answered together uh you can also look at the document uh, and comment on it i mean comment accordingly Um, uh there is a link uh it's in the chat it's in the chat um, and uh, i think this is a very good question i think to start with uh the participant hasn't written their name but i think yeah. most of us might have this question is there a reason why you choose to write punjab with an a and not punjab with a u maybe yeah, that's a good it, question yeah it's it's answered in the book it's answered in the very first chapter but i'll just tell you uh, very briefly right now that uh as a writer i feel that unpacking language is more important than than giving out fundas the reason i use punjab is because the original spelling is punj ab and these are persian words used by ibn batuta when he wrote his rihala after traveling in india he came in india at the time of mohammed bin tughlaq uh, uh the british when they uh, invaded punjab they used all sorts of spellings and punjab is what is now stuck to punjab uh but uh, in punjabi in gurmukhi we write it as punjab you know but that raises another question the question it raises is is punjab really punjab are five rivers flowing through it you know so then what are we doing really in making history you know you know and uh, is india really india because does it yeah. flow through india <laughs> you know? 
So actually, Pakistan should be called India, and India should be called Bharat. You know. Yeah. And then the Tamilians would have problems with it because Bharat is a Sanskrit word. You know, and Sangama literature is older than Sanskrit. <laughs> so, 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 so this is the whole idea of naming. You know. I just wanted to put a tease in the title itself so that everybody asks this question, reads the book, and finds it. Right. I'm sure you must be always getting this question. It must be exciting to keep answering it. You no, know, I um, like people to find out when they read it. I mostly tell, okay, read and understand. You'll know. But right. because this is an interactive session, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have two questions from Anish. Uh, Anish, do you want to pick one and ask it yourself, whichever one you want to start with? Hello, hello, sir. Okay, I'm confused. Aman, I'm, 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 an, I'm an, not sir. <laughs> <laughs> hello, and yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, the first question I would like like to ask is: Whenever we see a place that is affected by violence or trauma of any kind, we see the art at that place really thriving. But in Punjab, the general perception is that is mostly shallow when it comes to music, movies, and there aren't a lot of enough writing work coming from there. Why do you think that's the case? A very good question. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good question. It's a brilliant yeah. question. Um, I don't really know uh, whether places in conflict are always creating great art. Uh, I think art sort of comes when people are able to recover a bit from conflict. I mean, let's admit that most of us are not Sadatasan Mantu, you know was writing as partition was unfolding. Right? He was writing in the middle of partition. But if you look at mm. the greatest event of last day, century, partition, uh, most good writing starts coming on partition at least a decade or more later. Like Juta Such, I think, came out in the 1960s. Tamas came out in 1970s. Intizar Hussain's mm. Basti also came out in 1970s. I think it needs a little period of reflection through the violence. Uh, like when the Jewish Holocaust happened, I don't know which philosopher said, what is left to write? What is there to do? Uh, and then a, a quarter century later, a lot of writings came up. Uh, in that sense, I can tell you what most editors said to me when they learned I was working on this book. They said, it is Punjab's time now. What I think they meant is that 25 years have happened. Of course, everything is a big question mark, but we can now start asking that question, which wasn't possible earlier. Okay. And, and at present, there's a lot of good work happening in Punjab, with smaller, bigger artists, not the regular Bollywood trope, or yeah. not these drugs, and not the guns and girls songs, but yeah. there's a lot of good work happening. Yeah. Writing, yeah. I think the whole generation has gone away from it. Yeah. Um, I am a misnomer in that sense. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, uh, Amandeep, I'm going to just, just bring in one question here uh, because I do feel maybe it connects. Is this phrase that you use that uh, Punjab has been a neglected history? And I would want to perhaps. Uh, interpret it or sort of demystified. Do you mean neglected history in a certain context or in a certain time period uh, or in a certain genre of work? I'm just, ref I mean, connecting it with the art question that is it that some things about Punjab are not said or is it Punjab is not talked about in a much larger context? What did you mean? Well, this is again a very good question and at many levels, but if you really look at Punjab has never really talked about itself. Hmm. It's always somebody from outside who has come and documented Punjab. And even like this big movie that we are talking about, this Urta Punjab, it also Anurag came from somewhere and made a movie. And, you know, again, you are recording, so I can't tell certain things. You know, but <laughs> I can gossip bitch about it later. You know, but, uh, but Punjab has not really talked about itself. Hmm. When you don't talk about itself, and when national perceptions change, you know, I I am of the generation. I saw my father within half an hour losing respect and becoming a hunted man. On the day Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated, my father goes to the market to buy something 
and every time before that people would call him sardar ji and give him respect and and that day they were maro sala ko maro sala sardar hai and then my parents stayed in a gurdwara for more than a week escaping the mobs you know and uh, my people uh, i'm not saying my in the sense of is not think like that but uh, the sikh people remain a uh, paraya of indian society for about a decade from the 80s to early 90s you know in many ways it's uh, manmohan singh whose birthday is today you know he redeemed the image of the good sikh hmm and also the national gaze shifted from sikhs to muslims yeah. and it became like oh muslims are the, the dangerous people now you know there's all bullshit all completely what's it uh, i am in the talk lakshmi yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Uh, yeah you know uh, and from time to time the, the this current atmosphere tells us you know anybody becomes anti national i mean somebody would have joke today i mean 50% of india's population is agrarian uh, and now the bhaktas will say that all 50% have become anti national you know because they protested yesterday so all these are labeling and it keeps changing depending on who is in power and uh, punjab has not been in power for many centuries it has been fighting delhi Uh, for the last five, six centuries, at least. Uh, so yeah, it does make sense. I mean, that's that's what I was sort of hinting towards. Yeah, that it's so that's, it's that's the work why... and the narrative from the city, it's from the state itself, which is sort of uh, missing. You know, speaking for your own self, basically. That yeah. is why I said earlier when I started, no, that I am myself a victim of state narrative. I imbibed all these things unquestioningly. Mm. That. india needed to invade darbar sahib you know that these terrorists were out to declare khalistan you know and stuff but if you look deeper into the history is much more reveals itself or though that it was a sikh versus hindu see it never ever turned sikh versus hindu never ever turned even in its peak terrorism period it never became sikh versus hindu that that mm. we call it the no master rishta i mean the, the relationship between the nail and the skin you know it's that is the relationship between or or dood pani ka rishta you know that that's the rishta of the two communities mm. they're so intermingled with each other it never became mm. an anti hindu thing but look at social media look at how right wing forces behave you know oh why is it only a sikh narrative why don't hindus you know <laughs> yes we know we know what they are doing and where we are going with all of this so yeah i think that's what makes these conversations more important as well i'll move on to priyanjali uh, she has a question um, do you want to ask yourself if you there okay i don't see her online so i'm going to wait for her to be back deepthi can you pick one question and uh, yeah lead the conversation thank you aman i'm really grateful that i'm here at the audience uh, it has been a really uh, enlightening and wonderful session um, um i have several questions i have a lot more to ask but yes i was wondering if you have a structure in mind before you start gathering narratives i did see your uh, uh, i cannot call it a flow chart but i did see this little matrix. script matrix 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 um but um i i i often wonder because uh, the stories that you begin to hear from people and the narratives that you get sometimes are so overwhelming that it might just move you away from the matrix and make you uh, reconsider uh, what you already put in the matrix uh, and uh, also i i wonder um, when you're gathering narratives if you think like when do you know that this is enough Uh, and i'll start with the last one first you never know it is enough you know i mean there is always a new narrative there is always something or you as a writer have to take a call at some point you know okay enough i mean i, I can't really i've tried to listen to seven aspects of the same story um they're good enough for me i know there might be three more which i'm missing out 
but I can get to the essence of what is happening here. And in that sense of essence, there's something we missed talking in the talk, is what did the black hole in my heart fill up with? You know? With the black hole in my heart filled up with empathy for the resistance of Punjab. This is a land which for hundreds of years has been invaded, battle going on, but it is also a very resisting land. It has always resisted power hegemonies. You know. So when you see that happening in a story, or you come to that, and it gets confirmed from various sources, say, for example, I take an example of one guy. There was this noted militant called Rashpal Singh Channa, Kanda, you know, and there were various stories about him. Police thought he was like really bad and all that. And uh, I met people in the, in the in the area where he used to be, and they said, no, he was a good man. So there's this conflict now. And by chance, I bumped into a Hindu shopkeeper. I was asking him directions for something, and he told me this guy's story. And then he told me how two guys had come try to loot his shop as well. And he had been shot from here, and the bullet had gone out, not hit the head, at least it had from the upper cheek, you know. And uh, he was he was flat. Eleven days later, when he wakes up from coma, Rashpal's father comes to him and says, "Beta, you are a Hindu man in this village. You come and open your shop in this village. Even after this has happened, don't go away. We will give you protection. You stay here. You function here." You earn your livelihood here. Then you realize that there is something deeper happening in this story. And then you realize that Rashpal Singh stood up against the violence of the Indian state. He was very aggrieved by Golden Temple attack, you know. But he was going back two centuries back to a time when the Sikhs used to actually create fiefdoms and manage them when these aggressors would come, when Ahmed Shah Abdali was attacking, for example when uh, you know, Nadir Shah came, for example, there was these Sikh fiefdoms into which they would not allow these guys to enter and they would defend them. And Chanda had basically gone back to an earlier period of the community's history to become the kind of man. He had never killed an innocent person in his life. In fact, when he died, he was captured, he was brutally tortured. I know from a police guy how he was given you know, the 180 degree, when your legs are completely opened up and your, your body tears from pelvis upside, you know, and then you mostly die. When he died, thousands upon thousands of villagers went down to the police station to demand his body. And when they got the body, they did a very honorable funeral for him. And he was a terrorist. So when you hear these stories from various sources, then you realize the essential humanity of a story at some point. And that is your sort of intuition. That is your, your writer's knack. You know? And then you say, enough. I can keep digging more and more into it, but I've got it. Then you take that story, you put it in the book. Regarding structure breaking, of course, that is why I said from the proposal, which I thought happily I'll go roam around for two, three months, there will be a book ready, you know, like from... From that proposal to this matrix that I showed you was a huge change because this matrix is a distillation of all the work, all that I had understood by traveling. The structure was very linear. Going back to the chapters now, if you look at it, they might echo the original structure. But you know what they say? Before you are enlightened, rivers are rivers, mountains are mountains. When you're getting enlightened, rivers are no longer rivers, mountains are no longer mountains. Once you're enlightened, rivers once again become rivers, mountains once again become mountains. But the journey happens. So it is this breaking down of the brain that to me, what you said, when you hear stories, they become an overwhelming, they rupture your structure. I actually loved, I'm not a sadomasochistic kind of a guy, it showed up in my depression that happened, but you actually love going through that churning so that finally when you say something, you are 150% damn sure that this is not received knowledge, this is experiential knowledge. That is why it matters to you.
like now the protest is going on i just open the book random page i pick up put i put it on facebook and suddenly it is getting like you know likes and all that and that's only because this comes from experience boss i know it it's my blood now hmm. i went to te- check the texture of my blood i know it now So at this point, I think it'd be very nice to take on uh, Kamal's question about a specific uh, research inquiry. Kamal, are you there? Yeah, I'm Otherwise, here. Otherwise, yeah, I think that question I think follows up quite well. If you want to pose it any other way. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. That's actually the one I was thinking of asking. So I said, are you driven by a specific research question, or are you exploring out of curiosity? just cuz like to keep on going i i was really fascinated at your ability to keep on going heart is a bottomless well no <laughs> if you are plugging the black hole in your heart it takes i mean at some point you stop but uh, even the other question i saw of yours i mean how do you keep going and when do you stop i mean basically i'll go back and quote a dear friend of mine james kaikini the writer he said to me when my second book was that he said i said i have done my book he said no you know it is you have come out of the book the book has now got a life of its own but you are never done as a writer because there is always a more book one more book to do and i realized that in punjab i wanted to write this mega book on punjab but i actually wanted it to be 250 pages i mean it's improbable how do you do that It became 550 pages. 80,000 words were still cut out. That would be another 200 pages, you know. And I realized that this is just my little offering. There is so much more to write about Punjab. I, I actually, I'm very, very honestly, I thought it's a small patch of land. It can be travelled easily. I know the issues. I can face them. And now I realize it is a bloody ocean. and you are forever swimming in it you know and it will never get done you know so sources hmm. leaving sources keeping sources all that is part of the journey you abandon certain kind of answers you abandon when you when you see people not speaking genuinely you just leave them out you know? there is much more material to handle So over here, I'm going to bring in my question, which is very perhaps naive and something which you must have come across uh, every now and then. But I think it's very important to some of the projects that are on board for this program. Is how did you tackle? Because I think it's really an issue. How did you tackle the aspect of subjectivity that comes along with you when you are an insider um, into the conversation? When you're an outsider, I think it must be easy. So if I'm pushing an agenda, then subjectivity comes into play. But if I am able to prune my agenda, Baji, through actual stories that I am getting and processing within myself, and learning from them all the time, then subjectivity gets handled at a certain level. You don't really have to worry about it. You simply do it by changing the definition. As I said, if you say there is nothing called non-fiction, everything is good in the world. There is no objectivity. I don't believe that there is objectivity at all. You know. the most objective are also functioning within certain structures and are hence actually subjective you know yeah. then there is a degree of subjectivity and hmm. a spectrum of subjectivity now in this spectrum of subjectivity the question really is are you speaking a universal truth are you speaking to a universe of truth or are you limiting yourself to one narrow viewpoint with an agenda that i have to prove this you know i have to mm. prove nothing i realized by the end of the book i needed to prove nothing i needed to say nothing i managed to map my journey and i've done with it i have no agenda mm. of it right uh, i think that was also a good way of presenting though when you started the presentation by telling us uh, no piece of fiction uh, is uh, there's no non no piece of fiction actually So you basically prepared us to be able to see that everything was being done objectively as much as, as it, possible. As I said, I weave these three things: facts and events, contextual history about them, and my memoir. You know, mm. there are many things I left out, and that is why women and Dalit get left out because women and Dalit are not part of my memoir. Right. I have not let them out from the book. I mean, there is a woman in every chapter, 
there is hmm. chapter devoted to caste there is chapter devoted to uh, to patit you know how segregation happens but i can't make a claim that i have written a woman oriented book or a yeah. dalit oriented book no i have not done that that is in fact a very superficial uh, assumption or understanding to say by putting in a voice of a certain minority you have spoken for them so it's rather to be more honest to say you can't speak for them they have to I write for them i think yeah. there's too much speaking for other people going on i think we should have yeah, already about. exactly yes yeah. uh saman uh, i do believe your questions answered but if you want to phrase it any other no, way uh, no i think it's with deepthi's question and my question was almost similar so i think that really got answered so yeah yeah okay raj uh, do you want to take on your question and maybe keep it a little crisp yeah hello uh, hi yes we can hear you <coughs> so all i want to know is that uh, if you are working with some sort of archives and especially visual archives so and all the stories and information you got is from other people so how do you make a body of work like how do you do justice to uh, those work because you have been not involved in all those experiences and all so as it hmm. justice justice so as a as a writer i acknowledge them yeah this i want to like acknowledgement that. say so and so person told me this so and so person experienced this said this to me ha huh. but whatever i could not acknowledge i put them in the acknowledgements itself you know but i've not used anybody's material like for example i'll give you a, a there's a fantastic photographer who also made a documentary recently a guy called randeep madoke uh, uh he had a very good run in bangalore of his documentary or landless you know i spent a lot of time with him because to me he was a very fine artist also a dalit man and i really wanted to understand how he saw the world uh, at one point i was actually driving him around while he was shooting his documentary but nothing he told me did i put in my book nothing because it is his area this is his stories it is his subject material i can't steal from him i only put our conversations which are very very which indicative of things you know but or on the sidelines of seeing him work but his own content his own stories his own material you know why would i take it it is his it is his to use and it is the same with everybody everybody who i meet who i talk to some of them i quote like harjan who is a very good uh, social anthropologist film maker i don't talk about his works in my book in one film he shot me and another guy uh and uh, i was very interested in that guy and then i interview him and i put his interview in my book you know uh, arjant i mentioned in some other uh, context in the book as well so i if you i'm not looking for material of anybody else's material why would i look for it my only interest is my interaction with that person my engagement with that material if i have a take on my engagement with that material i'll put that i'll not put that material there that material is that artist if i might uh, with, i mean uh, if raj you are okay with it i think i'm going to sort of reposition his question because i think what he's really asking amandeep is uh, with a method like oral history or interviews which are otherwise in a way very vague to people who have not lived it but over here as an author you were trying to let's say relive it or at least interpret it on behalf of them for the book so do you feel that there's a possibility of doing justice when you use somebody else's lived experiences how do you connect with that material that's exactly Isn't what right, i said yeah right that's what i, I wanted to but yeah. i'm not trying to talk about other people's lived experiences okay i mean the, well, that's what i'm saying see randeep has immense stories of caste atrocities happening to him immense stories of poverty i did not want to use it in my book in fact in the book at some point i say this is a deeps material to use and i am uh, not even going to talk about it here you know and that's what you should do with anybody now for example if like let's take a hypothetical not a hypothetical let's take a real example 
the caste wars that I was telling you about land, you know. So four days after an attack had happened, I went down to the place. My wife also came with me. And uh, she's a non-Punjabi. And women in the crowd were taking her aside, taking her into a house. And I couldn't figure out what was happening. Initially, I was a little like, I she safe. And then she like, she nodded to me, she's okay. Women after women were taking her inside, removing their clothes and showing her injury marks on their bodies. Okay. Right? On the breasts, on the inner thighs, on the pelvic region, on the buttocks. This is called Gupt Chot in Punjab. Upper caste uses it a lot. You hit women at a place where they can't reveal it publicly, so there will be no evidence of this having happened. Okay. Right? Mm. right. Now that is important to write about because this is this is something which is there are various kinds of beatings in Punjab. If you use mushroom stick, uh, what is shatut called? Mulberry sticks. Mm. You know, you know, you will not leave, uh, and you use them on the soles of the feet. You will not leave marks there. Sugar no. cane doesn't leave marks. Right? Now I'm talking because two guys, I mean, my father's, my grandfather had participated in a surf movement. It, it was reclaiming land. The serfs are reclaiming their land because of which he was thrown out of the village by the bigger landlord in the village. You know, that bigger landlord's son ended up beating two Dalit men so badly that they died. But there was not a single mark on their body. Now, I want to tell this story. Mm. This is a story of the Dalit men. This is a story of that man. But this is also a story of my grandfather. Mm. And then this is a story of my aunt, who I come and tell this story to. And she has Alzheimer's. And she says, Amarjeet, Amarjeet to tere papa ke saath school jata tha. I'm like, gosh, what do you say here? Then? He was my father's good friend. Mm. When my parents used to live, when my father used to live in that village before they were thrown out. And then they became sworn enemies. But what they did to Dalits was even worse. What they did mm. to these women were even worse. These stories I need to tell. These right. stories in some ways are investigative, but these stories also belong to those people. But I tell it very, very differently. I tell it mm -hmm. through Rupa's eyes. I am listening to the brother of the man who was killed. Mm. And Rupa does not speak. If you read that section in the book, it is in that silence I tell the horror that is happening. I have still not told the story. No. Or in okay. Lakshmi's silence, I tell the story of what happens to these women. And she is telling me the story, the silence that is there in it. To that, I tell what is happening to me. Mentioning that it happened to so and so is, is just filling in the detail. But I'm never identifying who exactly. But you don't need to do that. In writing, there is this way in which you tell. I told you, right? In the, I'm not going to do pornography of pain. Okay. That's the big American writing that sells today. Sadly, it is becoming the big African writing also which is selling today. Mm. I did not want to do that. Mm. That, that answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there are ways of telling. Read the book. <laughs> I, <should also> tell <laughs> I think now the conversation is going in the right direction where you are yeah. leaving us so intrigued that we all are going to grab our yeah. copies soon. Yeah, yes. please do because uh, there are ways of doing things. Yes, we and we need and to I, understand. I am very clear I am not going to poach on anybody's territory. Hmm. But Rupa's silence, I still remember it. We sat like around 12, 13 minutes facing each other and he would just not speak. That can be the weight of uh, humiliation on you. Yeah. Or with Randeep, I mean, I'm, he has this big camera and he has to shoot from top of the Gurdwara and there is this old man, you know, who's stopping him. And Randeep says, yeah, why? Don't you know me? I'm from your village. He says, no, I don't know you. He says, you know my father? You know, he used to bring you your food. He says, whose son are you? That Jack's son, that Jack. He said, no. 
and the son of that majbi who used to bring you food. Oh, dad! So he's just saying that I'm conveying the whole horror of task that is happening. And then, as Randeep gets angry and no longer seeks permission and enters anyway, then that guy is remarking from his back, "Look at these boys, big cameras they carry these days." And in that one thing, you have conveyed the whole caste humiliation that has been happening for for generations on that family. Okay, thank you. So um, we have overrun by eleven minutes, but I'm going to suggest that we take two more questions, or rather three more questions, and wrap it by seven thirty, if that's okay with everyone. Amandeep, you especially. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm very glad um, that. Sticking on here. Who listens to two and a half hours on some to some? Yeah, I think there's there's some sort of validation for you there. So we've really enjoyed the no, conversation. I, I was no really happy. I was telling you, Shita, it is too long a period you have given. You know, we won't be able to fill it. I don't know. So, no, the yeah. process always is, uh, I think, enriching. So, Vallabhi, over to you uh, with your question. And I'll end with uh, my yeah, question. My, my question. Mic yes. is mute. Yeah. Yeah. So hi, Amandeep. Uh, my question has uh, basically come out of a discussion with a friend who was reading your book, CPR Leaves, and uh, basically, uh, this is a question. Also, uh, basically, like all of us in India, our history are so displaced. Like I am uh, basically my family, all the cultures from Rajasthan, but I myself, I live in. UK. So, like, this is how this question has arise. That you know, when you belong to a certain place, but you live in a certain place, then uh, how does the idea of attachment to a place, you know, like, what do you think about it? So, this is my question: How different is your relationship with rural Kerala and Punjab, and uh, what do you think about place attachment in general? No, that's a very good question. I, you know, I I have a slightly different take on it because. I personally believe we don't live in, in places. We actually live in the places we have configured in our heads, <laughs> in our experiences. We actually live not even in places or languages or families or relationships, but we actually live in stories. And if we are able to tell ourselves good, coherent stories about the places, then we feel we are settled. But when our stories have ruptures, then we feel unsettled. What is an exiled person? What is a voluntary exile person? You are a voluntary exile. I am a voluntary exile. There might be half the half the people here might be non-Kannadiga, not from Bangalore. You know, in fact, most of the names I see are non-Kannadiga. You know, we are all exiled. But are we able to tell good stories about this exile? If we are, then we are feeling happy. But if our stories are ruptured. <laughs> If our stories have gaps that we are unable to fill, then we feel isolated, you know, and then we try to find ways of connecting. So my story of Punjab remained ruptured, and it is partly because my mother was schizophrenic. Because when I used to be in her in her lap when I was very very young, these stories are told much earlier to us, and then we just keep building them in our life you know, through our experiences. When I would, she would cook. There would be clothes at home from Punjab. There would be taste would be there. There would be touch would be there. There would be visuals would be there. The Guru's photos or Bhagat Singh's photo or whatever. But audio was not there. Because when I would ask my mother stories of Punjab, she would start telling me them. But then, because she was herself not well, her stories would splinter all over the place. They would turn into volleys of abuse, and that left me incomplete in my audio sense of Punjab, in the story sense of Punjab. And that's what pushed me now to go and complete that story of my life. In fact, first, second, and third book now make a trilogy on Punjab, which is sort of considered a, a circle, you know, in, in literature. So it is up to us to find our stories and to. If we don't inhabit them well, then to find ways of inhabiting them well, and sometimes the story is actually in how we inhabited them. It's hmm. true for you. You are a Rajasthani migrant. I am a Punjabi migrant. 
same boat. You have come from a culture which has seen wars for hundreds of years. You would know this. You were at the end of the, or at the Indian side of the Silk Route. You know, like Silk Route. Churu is the gate to the Silk yeah. Route, right? You are from Churu. See, like, like, look at that. You know, like so. Churu yeah. is a is a opening to the Silk Route. You know. So, and we need to start making our story. You need to make your stories in the deserts of Thar. Thank you, Valavi. Um, so we have one question from Priyanjali, which she's asked me to read it out. How do we find an editor when you are just starting off, and how does one understand more about publishing and publishers? You talk to me. What can one say? There is no magic formula to it. I lost. Good editors for two of my first books. I really wanted an editor to lift each of that book. I know Sepia Leaves continues to be read. Just now, Vallabhi told us that some friend is reading it. I get two or three messages even thirteen years later that somebody or the other is reading that book. You know, and they can be connecting back to me. Actually, to answer Vallabhi's question, if Vallabhi is still there, is that they say these two words, Vallabhi? They say thank you, yeah. and I ask them why are you saying thank you. And they say because as readers, we feel we don't own our stories. Our stories are owned by that person whose care we are taking. You know, but this book is telling us that we also have stories. <laughs> you know, caregivers also have stories. So what I was coming back to finding editor is, I still wanted somebody to lift Sepia Leaves one more level. Mm. Like I wanted somebody to lift Roll of Honor one more level. Yeah. I finally found Karthik, with whom I don't know whether you saw it. I mean, there were we did three drafts, and we did then three rounds of proofreading. Okay. And still today, there are some seventeen or nineteen errors in the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So finding a good editor, finding an editor after your heart, is. Is a great stroke of luck. And, uh, and this recent piece that he commissioned me on mental health, this uh, bravado to fear to abandonment, mental health during the lockdown. I am such an idiot that I still don't realize what Karthik needs. I'm trying to give him complete copy. He's like, boss, I'm not interested in your complete copy. I'm interested in your draft. Because then I can work with your draft, and we can together complete the copy. Right. You know, he keeps upping my level of what I should ask from my editor, and in the process, he ups the level of the of the writing itself. I had oh. ranted in this piece. I had ranted against, you know, why lockdown happened. This happened. Karthik simply picked it all up and threw it out. He said the piece works, and it actually works. Hmm. So a good editor <clears throat> is is truly one. If they are rare, and second is you have to vibe with them uh, because you can be the most fantastic editor. But if you're a writer and you don't have confidence with each other, then it doesn't help. And finally, uh, it should work for both of you. you should learn from each other. All right. So Maybe wife, you should have added a question. My, my whole fight with Karthik is. Is Harun Khalid your favorite Punjabi writer, or am I your favorite Punjabi writer? You know, he hasn't still answered that. Harun Khalid is this lovely, lovely writer from Pakistan. <laughs> we are all yeah. vying. We are all vying for Papa Karthik's, you know, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so I had I had insisted I had messaged Karthik today morning to tell him that you know it would be wonderful if he was here and he could have answered some of the questions as well. <laughs> But he yeah. couldn't join because it's his mom's birthday. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, Parents have come to his place. He told me. Yeah. yeah. So otherwise, it would be nice to have a nice to see the dialogue between you two about some yeah. of these questions which you are answering. Because I, the role of the editor, the way you're explaining, is becoming so pivotal in the in the way the work has come out. Um, so I'm going to hold on to my question because Mevish has one, and I think that's the last one we'll take, and then mine, and then we close with for the evening. Mevish, do you want to uh, say it out yourself? Ask it. Uh, hi, uh, my question is very simple. You know, you've mentioned in your process the event-based uh, information and the factual information. 
and uh, then then there are too many agendas going around you know uh, too many uh, too much information and too many jargons which are used by the social media so how do you keep your track uh, uh, how do you keep your concentration on what you've intended as a research Now, and you know what what does your day look like while you're writing and while you have a deadline <laughs> first of all we chose not to have deadlines because uh, i told kartik it will be ready when it is ready you know i will come to you when i need a deadline after the first draft was done i went to him and i said kartik now give me a deadline then he gave me a deadline three months later you know on the day of the deadline he i said uh, i need three days more and <laughs> i gave it in three days later it was very interesting actually he told me end of september i said can i give it on gandhi jayanti you know i don't know why you know it's somewhat symbolic as well you know uh, gandhi is after all a person of truth you know? and then uh, then after 17 days i sent him a little more more rework draft i said if you haven't opened that can you please look at this one he said yes but stop sending me drafts on the like, okay you know like so i mean this is the relationship you have but your question on social media is very important because <clears throat> uh, uh many of my mentors my well wishers i used to be a very engaged social media activist in some ways and they told me find out get back it's not right to fritter your energy away on social media but i don't know my my view was slightly different my was that i am not in the process of making a book to make a name for myself these are battles we are fighting and if the discourse today is being turned around against us then we must fight the discourse right here on the forum on which it should be fought you know so i remained a very engaged social media person only facebook not twitter not instagram <clears throat> throughout the period of writing this book and uh, i would i would feel it the same responsibility as writing the book but and this happened on uh, <clears throat> when congress won the elections in madhya pradesh chatisgarh and uh, rajasthan and they appointed kamal nath the prime minister the chief minister that day i lost it <laughs> and for the next 10 days i could not get back to writing and that was the only <clears throat> uh, sort of thing i had given myself that if i am not able to write for more than one week i'll go and meet my doctor mm-hmm. and why i lost it was that when bjp came to power in 2014 there was a lot of resistance to it by many people mm-hmm. uh, and you you we felt that okay there is a fascism rising right wing rising you know stupid religious religious politics rising but there is also a lot of sensible people which is it's okay they are in power now they will lose next time we'll deal with it but when the very same people who were opposing bjp now started supporting kamal nath who is involved in the 1984 genocide of the sikhs i felt this was hypocrisy mm. and that something broke in me it snapped in me i couldn't come up for another 10 days that's when i met the doctor he said you are a full blown case of depression yeah get on to medication i said okay you don't do it so mm. that was the reason that happened so how do you keep your focus you keep swimming that like and when you can't swim you go and ask help to swim Thank you for such honest answers, Amandeep. Um, so mine is uh, my final comment and question is really in response to the theme. So uh, this is something I should have told earlier, but these talks that we are doing on archiving or archival practices, uh, we are seeing it under four specific themes, which sort of address the whole idea of archiving practices in the global south and <clears throat> and the need to decolonize and the need to subvert the narrative. so the theme under which we identified your talk was beyond institutional narrative and this was in discussion with you because you saw that the state narratives were either misconstrued or were missing state archives or state data was missing 
and i want to now ask you a final question as to seeing the flip side of it what is the positive what is the benefit why it, did it work in your favor that the state archives or the state data was missing because once i hear you it it seems like a boon in a way that it worked that is how the book happened am i am i right and how would you address it i hear you and realize it was a boon you know thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i didn't see it as as a boon as oh shit i've been like i've been working to get it uh, you know you sometimes get lost in the fight and yes. now i'm hearing you and i'm like yeah actually you making much more sense yes. yeah. in a way good <laughs> in a way yes. good yes. yeah yeah because if there was very solid data mm. it might have been difficult to question it yes you know? that's that's what yeah we see it as cast in stone yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then this allowance that you have had that you could work with so many diverse sources right. and try and tie it down which must have been a difficult process but is because the boundaries were permeable and rather there were no boundaries the fact that there was this 585 to 16000 such a big leap in the data itself allows you to now maneuver and and you know explore the grounds i think that's that's totally a blessing i mean I know that the national narratives are not there. No, I'm taking, so I'm taking that from this talk here. Yeah. Thank you. I I hadn't seen it like that. Yeah. Okay. And that's uh, great. Okay. So we'll then end I mean, with that. We yeah, normally so we normally mourn the absence of what we take for granted, hmm. and uh, we don't really look at it and see, oh, brilliant, that is missing. There's all this space here now, you know. <laughs> I have been. I have occupied that space. Now this book is being read in universities. It's being prescribed. I am doing classes in two places. I I did two classes, but oh. I hadn't seen uh, it as this. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I mean that's surely my perception. Once I hear you, uh, of course, the reviews is what I've read until now. Uh, i still hope to ca- get a copy of the book soon till i can reach blossoms but in the meanwhile at least once i hear you and the fact that yes you have been able to explore questions so many questions that you asked uh, I, i mean it's a very nice thing to say again from a very academic perspective but we have been able to question things only when they are weak only when there are gaps once we find very sacrosanct histories and narratives out there we have really like had to you know break our arm to perhaps open the door i mean i'm just using right. an analogy here right. so the right. fact that these state archives were missing allows for such a book and i i can now imagine many more such projects or books inspired from something like this especially yeah. for punjab yeah and other states here i really hope that there yeah. are two or three books on every state which fight with each other yes. then in that fight people will make sense you know like Yes. Here yes. it is now. It is like putting out this book. It is already such a fat book. It seems like the most authoritative work. You know, it should not be seen like that. Not at all. It yes. It seems as as one person's take. You know, let it be contradicted by another. Let it be contradicted by another. Let them be a battle yes. of books to happen. You know, that is what will make sense to readers. And True. I think it should happen to every state. I mean, every state should do this, or every. people every language every ethnicity whatever category might suit you so and i think i mean we have seen uh, some of such examples whether it's mythologies or whether it's gandhi and nehru it's only when we have had many more perspectives re- to read about them is when you know we have our own understanding interpretation yeah. of histories yeah. otherwise yeah. again the fear of history becoming something sacred saying something i can't touch and i have to believe in it blindfoldedly is what is causing the troubles that we are right now trying to fight against uh, right. so that quite very important yes thank you i mean that's a wonderful note to close on thank uh, thank you, thank you aman ji for taking our time for and us and for the people who are you. sitting for two and a half hours yeah my yes, god i think thanks I, to everyone <laughs> when i was younger i wasn't this good huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah thank and, you very much uh, Yes, and do watch out for the next set of talks. So we'll have one conversation each month. It will be fourth Saturday of the month, uh, so that doesn't change. And you can follow us on our Instagram and Facebook handles. 
uh, and yes you can bring in uh, children of the house or grandparents of the house to also listen to these conversations just if now, you find it interesting just now deepthi's child joined i was like waving whether yeah that's that's why i'm talking to her she is the person been around yeah. for most of our sessions actually yeah he's been <laughs> around for most of our sessions i'm sure he's going to take up archiving and reinterpreting history as well <laughs> faster <laughs> yeah. wonderful all right so on that note i Yes, we shall all say goodbye. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. 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 Th